for organizing this event and of course uh, Taj Bengal. Uh, and uh, you know Shugato Bose obviously needs no introduction. We, uh, but uh, there is an introduction which is uh, not there in that uh, invitation card uh, which a lot of people didn't know because I happened to know him quite closely for the last 10 years or so. And uh, apart from being one of the uh, most renowned academicians, uh, he's a professor of history at Harvard, we all know that. Uh, he's also an excellent singer. And uh, probably uh, no one in the audience knows, he's also a filmmaker because, uh, you know, I'm into film. So uh, he had made a documentary that was uh, almost 20 years back, I would say, more than that. Which one are you thinking of? Uh, the, uh, there are three documentaries that I made. Then I, I, I am telling you about the Hindutva thing. Oh, yes. That yeah. was uh, more than two decades ago. It was uh, filmed during the general election of 1991. Okay. And it was okay. called Mandir, Masjid, Mandal, right. and Mars. Right. Well, subsequently, you made more? Uh, Actually, before that, I made hmm. uh, one called Rebels Against the Raj, which okay. was shown on PBS in the United hmm. States in 1986. Uh, and uh, subsequently, I made another one for Netaji Research, okay. called Netaji and India's Freedom. But as you would right. know, right. Uh, filmmaking is a very capital intensive enterprise. I can capital write books and labor. Yeah. And labor too. <laughs> but, uh, but you can write books if you just uh, deploy intellectual labor. Whether you get a grant or not, hmm. you may still be able to produce a good book. But for films, right. uh, it's, uh, it's quite different. Uh, but I would like to go back to a little hmm. bit of documentary filmmaking right. at some point. So let's uh, start the discussion with, uh, you know, Shugatuda. And I want to start with, uh, you uh, come from uh, one of the most illustrious families in Bengal. And uh, uh, your, your mother is also here now. Uh, not only Shubhash Bosh, but, you know, your uh, Shorod Bosh and your parents. Uh, how did that influence you uh, while growing up uh, to be, uh, you know, from Shubhash Bosh, Shorod Bosh's lineage and growing up in such a family, palpably down, now do you look back and think that how did it influence you as a person while growing up? Well, my father, uh, Dr. Shishir Kumar Bose, uh, always told me that the fact that I am uh, uh, belong to the family of... Uh, Netaji Shubhash Chandra Bose is merely an accident of birth. And therefore, uh, I should not claim any special privilege because of that. And he would always tell me an anecdote. In fact, two anecdotes. One, of course, is that uh, Netaji used to say that uh, his family and his country were coterminous. And so everyone in India belonged to Netaji's family. You, you think there was a chance of getting well, attracted? Well, I think there were many idealistic young men just a little bit older than me who were attracted. Uh, and of course, uh, the Nakshalbari uprising had been hailed by uh, Chairman Mao as the spring thunder of the Indian Revolution. But as I said in one of my books, uh, it refused to spread like a prairie fire, mm. to mix Mao's uh, mm. metaphors. And it degenerated into a, an erratic campaign of urban terrorism, with even policemen, such as traffic constables, being attacked. attacked. And that's what I saw it as. But I have to say that the Nakshalite movement had a longer term influence on me in terms of selecting my topics for research. Uh, I used to go with my father uh, to the Bonga border uh, every Sunday. Uh, my father, of course, uh, looked after the children in the refugee camps. I had not seen such human squalor and such misery before. Uh, but in addition to looking after children, uh, he had started something called the Netaji Field Hospital. And uh, wounded soldiers of the Bangladesh Mukti Bahini would be brought across the border. And there would be surgeons from Calcutta who would be doing operations. Mm. And that is the only time in my life that I've actually seen operations being conducted because you know, the op operation theater was nothing but an open room or sometimes these operations would be done in verandas and there was a shortage of saline and I used to see surgeons using uh, dabidjal, coconut water uh, instead of uh, saline. Mm. So 
there too, you know, I became interested in, in partition. And even 1971 had an agrarian dimension. Small holding jute growers of East Bengal clearly were very disenchanted with the Pakistan regime. It was not just the educated middle classes or the students and teachers of Dhaka University. And uh, you had told me in uh, you know, personal conversations about the influence of uh, Amutthada at Cambridge when you went. And uh, you know, so how did an economist uh, you know, enter your scholarly field uh, sphere? I was working in the field of economic history. The main focus of my doctoral research uh, was the 1930s depression, a worldwide economic crisis, and how it affected the agrarian economy and society of colonial South mm -hmm. Asia, particularly Eastern India, which included both West Bengal and uh, Bangladesh. I remember when I was a PhD student, I had been invited to give a, a seminar at uh, Oxford. Mm -hmm. But for whatever reason, um, uh, Omar who was a Draman professor of political economy at that time at Oxford, wasn't there. But he heard about my paper, mm -hmm. and he contacted me. He wrote to me, and then he called me and said that he wanted to discuss things with me. Because he had just been working on uh, his book, Poverty and Famines. Mm -hmm. After that, Omar wanted to see the chapters of my dissertation and my book. I used to send him my chapters, and I used to get long typewritten replies. A typical letter would have 11 numbered paragraphs giving his uh, giving his comments. And what was the best thing about Amartya was that how well he would take criticism uh, from an overenthusiastic graduate student. Mm. You know, there would be chapters in my book where I would say that, you know, Amartya Sen is not right on this particular point, And he would, <laughs> he would actually respond with a tremendous grace mm -hmm. uh, to those Right. Uh, to those criticisms. And so, so it's from that point onward that mm. I sort okay. of developed this very mm. uh, close intellectual relationship. So that is what yeah. I was. And, and what do you think about the, you know, the democracy, the current trend, as I said, the democratic recession now? What is happening? What is the narrative here, do you think? Uh, uh, well, uh, there are two aspects to what you are referring mm. to as a Democracy, democracy deficit. recession. This was democracy actually recession, yes. uh, used in a yeah. uh, in the New York Review of Books had an article recently yes. on uh, the rise of authoritarianism, where they had used that term. So, yeah. What what I would say, of course, is that there are many parts of the world um, where uh, there are entrenched dictatorships, where the military institution is very dominant. Even in our own region, if you think of our neighboring country, Pakistan, it has civilian rule, but the military continues to be the dominant state institution. Mm -hmm. So there is a democratic political process, but uh, civilians are still subservient to the military uh, top brass. But, uh, and, and also, of course, uh, there have been major reversals, such as in Egypt. Mm -hmm. where on the one hand, you know, a, a democratic movement and an election uh, led to, the, ele uh, led to uh, the Muslim Brotherhood uh, coming to power. And of course, uh, there are many problems associated with the Muslim Brotherhood, but, but that movement was squashed mm -hmm. by a fairly dominant military institution, which hadn't really lost its power. Uh, so there are instances where uh, you might say that this democratic recession is characterized by the dominance of non-elected institutions of state. Gotten this Subhash Bosch uh, incident you said about you know where he criticized Germany over uh, in in there and Europe at that time, which was a very similar type of uh, action I would say from two great individuals of that time. Yeah. I have mentioned the Rabindranath Mussolini episode mm. even in this book mm. because. Despite you know distancing mm. himself from his early praise mm -hmm. of Mussolini in 1926, he nevertheless sort of had written again in 1930, seeking his help for Ita you know Italian studies in Shantiniketan. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Mussolini was a strange figure, and he won 
admirers among poets and mm. uh, major figures in the world of culture um, through simply his force of personality. And mm -hmm. Ezra Pound comes to mind, mm. for example. Mm -hmm. uh, and so one has to place oneself in the context of those times. Right, right. And th there's a lot that you can say with hindsight. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, and, uh, and even for the period of the Second World War, I would say that Churchill and Roosevelt knew much more about the atrocities being uh, you know, perpetrated by Hitler mm -hmm. uh, in the 1940s than did Shubhash sure. Chandra Bose. And sure. they could have actually done more mm -hmm. to stop uh, right. all of that. So you, mm -hmm. know, you have sure. to take a balanced view of, of these. Uh, so uh, my last question, and then I'll uh, uh, open it for questions from the audience, if any. But you have to promise me that you will answer it as a, you know, academician and not as a Trinomul MP. My primary, <laughs> identity, my primary identity is that is of a historian yeah, and a historian. scholar. Okay, so I'm simply trying given to that help in, out yeah. in the uh, uh, political right, sphere right, right. because I really do sure. think that this is a critical moment in exactly. our history. Yeah. I wouldn't have agreed to contest these elections right. if I didn't feel that we were sure. at a turning point in our political history. And of course, I didn't get the <laughs> so, results that I would have hmm. wished for. Right. But still, one has to provide a principled voice in opposition. So as an academician, uh, one thing which I enjoy, I'm sure everybody, at least in the US uh, or UK, that is academic freedom, right? Freedom of expression, freedom of thought. Yeah. When you, uh, you know, uh, join politics here, uh, the thing is that, you know, uh, interestingly, I come here also, uh, you know, three, four months later, I get a snapshot of things here. And I can tell you in West Bengal, there is a palpable fear operating, right? Uh, in all walks of life. I inter interact with a lot of people from different walks of life. And, uh, uh, you know, and in the last two months or so, a lot of things happened in the state to perpetuate this fear. Now, that's why I said that I want an answer from a free-minded, you know, historian who is seeing these things. What is your reaction to this? Well, um is there all pervading fear? It is. Uh, it because, is. Because, sure. you know, I also mm. see a lot of criticism of the, uh, of the government. If you read the papers, you began by saying that, of course, uh, being in the academy, mm. we value freedom of expression. And what I can say very categorically is that uh, I am uh, deeply committed to freedom of expression. And when there are major issues of morality or justice that are involved. Uh, I will, you know, always express myself freely, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I cannot, uh, you know, allow, you, you know, the compulsions of uh, being in parliament or mm -hmm. in or, or in party politics to constrain me. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and I think people understand that. Otherwise, you know. I wouldn't have been asked to come into the political sphere from academia, from a very different, uh, you know, background. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would simply say that um, we have to learn not to be afraid. You know, there was a point when the last regime collapsed, mm -hmm. when people lost their fear and spoke sure. up. Sure. Areas. Mm -hmm. Let West Bengal turn into an industrial graveyard mm -hmm. and still win in the rural areas, election after election, mm -hmm. by being entrenched in local governments, mm -hmm. in the panchayats, and so on. But that strategy will not work today. Sure. Because what we are witnessing is very rapid urbanization. And in fact, the boundary between what is agrarian and, and what is urban That's is getting blurred. Right. And therefore, we, we have to have a, a vision uh, which actually will deliver something of substance mm -hmm. uh, to young people in rural and urban areas alike. Mm -hmm. uh, and therefore, there is sure. need for, 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 for new thinking in, mm -hmm. in, sure. in, these, in okay. these areas. You're an academician, you're a politician. You're an academician by whatever you've done 
in your life, you're a politician, though many uh, out here in this state, including media, feel so surprised that why you were and why you are associated with the present government, and that's a different issue. But uh, there are two selves of you. Okay. Now, in this country, I feel that knowledge contradicts more with politics than it complements. So my question to you would be based on your experience as an academician, as a politician from this state, how and where do you think knowledge has been complementing and contradicting with you? Yes. Um, now that is a very large question. Why two selves? You know, we have many different kinds of identities. And unfortunately, in this. I said singer and yes, filmmaker. As you, were pointing, <laughs> as you were pointing out in, uh, in your introduction. But, but it's yeah. a, you know, since I've written on political economy and economic history, and then I suddenly write an essay in culture, there will be people in the United States who will come and ask me, are you the same Shugato Bose who wrote uh, on the 30s depression and you're now, you know, writing this uh, essay in hmm. uh, cultural criticism. I mean, they find it very difficult. But in Bengal, there was a time when you know, we, we, we broke down these boundaries of specialization. The, uh, we actually felt that to be educated, we had to traverse many different hmm. fields of, uh, of knowledge. And if I may say so, since we have concentrated on my, uh, on my father's side of the, of the family, I have probably been more directly influenced by my mother's side of the uh, family. Uh, I, I, I arrived a little earlier, so I got some time to read. Um, and what uh, struck me is that, uh, of course, it's wonderfully <coughs> researched, as many biographies are, but it's also um, it's uh, very warmly written. It's not at all dry. Um, as, and, and not very many biographies achieve that. Um, I'd like you to comment on how you arrived at that. It's a fine balance, how you arrived at it. It doesn't read like an academic book at all. I mean, it's, it's very, very engaging. Thank you. Uh, let's have your question. And my ask my question was in the context of your elaborations on Fukuyama and Huntington and the Alice Spring and so on. As a lay observer, it strikes me when I look at, say, recent developments in Iraq, India, dismantling a strong center. To me, it does not appear that democracy then Russia is mathematically different than Russia. So I'd love to hear your perspective of that as therefore a reflection on Alice Spring's failure, etc. You know, absolutely. absolutely. I mean, if you think about you know Gaddafi and Saddam Hussein, they were sort of dictators. But when there is the kind of intervention uh, that took place first in Iraq and more recently in Libya, there was not much thought given to the consequences. Uh, it, it, it was a complete inability to <coughs> think ahead of what would actually replace that vacuum. And again, and I would say this especially for Iraq, uh, there was that old colonial mentality which was inherited by the, the Americans to uh, see Iraq in terms of these ethnic categories of Sunni, Shia, Kurd, and so on. And this didn't come to pass uh, in any formal sense, but there was also this thought of perhaps partitioning along these ethnic uh, religious lines. And, and, and forgetting, of course, the history of partitions, that you know, territorial divisions take place when you are unable to share power. And it is much better to divide sovereignty than to divide land, because however you, in whatever way that you might carve up any piece of land or territory, you will always leave vulnerable minorities. Mm -hmm. And that is a sure recipe for that awful phrase, ethnic cleansing and, and, and so forth. And, and that's why I think um, one should sort of understand that you, know, you, you need time to build demo democracies, to actually have democratic values being imbued. So there are two things which happen. Either you have a strong institution which reasserts itself, as has happened in Egypt with the military. 
or you dismantle those institutions as well as happened in Iraq, the military, the Baathist party <coughs> got completely smashed. And now what's happened? It's the Baathists in disarray, in a context of complete anarchy. The, the last answer will be on my, on my book. Um, I have, uh, I, I paid some special attention to this. This book is based on a lot of research in many archives over, I don't know how many years, because uh, it's very hard to say. Um, but I, I wanted to write in an attractive and uh, accessible style for a wide readership, uh, not just for, for historians or academics, but for anyone uh, interested in books with an intellectual curiosity about either um, South Asian history or global history in the, in the 20th century. And I have always believed that uh, the historical essay is an art form. There is a very close relationship between history and literature, yes. which, uh, who, um, who encouraged me to write attractively. And I also remember what Eric Stokes, my PhD supervisor, told me once. And uh, he said, uh, Sugata, as he put it, you, you write well. So continue to write attractively. And don't be too constrained by what are mistakenly seen as academic conventions that uh, really you know, have to be, uh, have to be uh, followed. Uh, so th that's what has led me to write a book of this kind, which I hope people will enjoy reading.